بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أذن للذين يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم بغير حق إلا أن يقول ربنا الله ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لهدمت صوامع وبيع وصلوات ومساجن يذكر فيها اسم الله كثيرا The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Second louder salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma sallam. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. The discussion concerning defensive war or defensive jihad is one of the most fascinating discussions in Islamic law, as well as Islamic theology, as well as Islamic ethics. It's not just the discussion within the religion of Islam. In the religion of Christianity, Famous scholars such as Aquinas had always discussed what justifies going to war. What could the human being possibly put forward as justifying the right for them to engage in war or the right for them to defend themselves? In Latin, you look at the discussion under the title Jus ad Bellum. As you know, when you're looking at war, you're either looking at the reasons for war or the conduct during war or your conduct after war. In Latin, if it is the reasons for going to war, it's known as jus ad bellum. If it's the reason, if it is your conduct during war, it's known as jus in bello. If it's your behavior after war, it is known as jus ad postum. Therefore, you found that Aquinas, amongst others, would always discuss what's the rationality behind defensive war? What justifies going to war? Likewise, in the religion of Islam, the issue of defensive war is fundamental. Sufyan al-Thawri used to believe that there's only one form of jihad in Islam, and that is defensive jihad. Because rationally, as a human being, across all humans in the world, we all believe that we have a right to protect ourselves at certain junctures in our life. If we feel that, for example, a transgression has occurred against us, or there's a transgressor who's oppressed one of our rights in the state, there's a reason for us to put forward that we have a right to defend ourselves. Ultimately, one of the faculties that we have is the faculty of anger. The faculty of anger can be used positively and negatively. Positively, that when someone oppresses me or when someone transgresses against me, I cannot just turn the other cheek. Last night when we discussed our Imam and said that the worldview of Imam al Hussein was the primacy of peace, Imam al Hussein believed in the primacy of peace. But when someone transgresses the boundaries of the peace of society, then Imam al Hussein does not conform to a pacifist or a passive worldview. Rather, Imam al Hussein conforms to a worldview where a person has to be active, that when you've oppressed me, I cannot just sit back and watch this oppression. Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallamu alayhi has a lovely tradition. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa al-Hamad. 
where he states at takabbur ala al mutakabbir ibada arrogance against the arrogant is worship normally arrogance is negative but when someone arrogant is attacking me if i'm humble towards them i'm letting their power grow i'm letting their dominance grow whereas imam as-sadiq said arrogance is normally negative however at takabbur ala al mutakabbir ibada arrogance against the arrogant is a form of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you can't just sit back and watch this person yesterday we said Imam said that I have come to bring Islah the opposite of Islah is what if sad that if there's if sad there's corruption in the land and my rights are being usurped I surely have a right to stand up and defend myself if someone now is oppressing the five rights that any law should protect the right of property the right of our honor the right of having our intellect the right of life and the right of religion any legal system should seek to protect these five rights one's property one's honor one's intellect one's life and one's religion when any of these five are violated say someone attacks my property i bought a house in toronto and someone blatantly comes and attacks that house do I turn the other cheek or have I got a right to stand up against this? If someone attacks my sister or my mom in the street, do I turn the other cheek or do I have a right to stand up against this? If someone for example attacks my religion, that my religion blatantly the person mocks it, mocks the members of that religion, do I just stay silent or do I have a right to defend? This discussion is known as the discussion concerning defense of religion that when someone comes to attack you do you have a right to defend yourself or no some people ask the question that where in the quran for example does allah allow us to defend ourselves through war okay i may defend myself polemically say someone's debating me online i debate them online someone debates me at school i defend myself but to go to war does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this last night we said that war in Islam is the exception not the norm the norm is peace but is there any time where Allah justifies and allows you to come out and defend yourself in war is this allowed or not question number one question number two according to which battle was this allowed and why were these Muslims allowed to defend themselves for the first time? Number three, when someone attacks me, do I have to defend only the Muslims? And how did this verse of the Quran, which I quoted at the beginning, highlight that you have to defend anyone who believes in God in that country? Number four, am I going through a defensive war metaphorically living in the world today? And in which way are some of us facing our own Karbala wars in our lives today number five who can lead a defensive war any Tom Dick and Harry or must it be a man of justice and respect and number six and of the utmost importance how was this highlighted in the message of Imam Hussein and how did the Imam make clear that defense of one's values is a sign of humility and piety in the human being Let's discuss this and dissect the topic in complete depth. When one asks me where in the Quran has Allah sanctioned defensive jihad, Allah sanctioned defensive war. The ayah in the Quran is in Surah 22 verse 39 to 40 where Allah sanctioned defensive war. When the Muslims were persecuted for 13 years in Mecca. For 13 years, they were persecuted to the extent that their families were killed, to the extent that their children were killed, to the extent that they had no rights whatsoever within Meccan society. And there was one major reason why they were persecuted. Their belief in Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? Because when you see the ayah in the Quran, the ayah says permission has been given to the fighters to defend themselves. Because they were oppressed. Yes. 
الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم بغير حق إلا أن يقول ربنا الله they were forced to leave their houses for no reason except their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala question you're telling me the Meccans kicked these Muslims out of Mecca because they believed in Allah was it as simple as that the point is that the Meccans themselves believed in Allah the Meccans believed in Allah in the Quran they make it clear that we believe in the same God that you do but the reason they kicked those early Muslims out was because the concept of Tawheed with the Muslims differed with their concept of Tawheed in which way number one the Muslims were saying you believe in God but you have idols that represent that God yeah as we know shirk can be in a number of different ways shirk doesn't mean you believe in more than one God only there are some people who think that shirk means you only believe in one God Whereas shirk, no, shirk can be you believing in one God, but you putting statues for that God. Or you putting idols for that God. When they would be told, these idols, we can break them, we can destroy them. Surely you don't really worship a God that you yourself can carve and make. They say, no, these idols get us closer to Allah. Yeah? They are representations of Allah. Allah, Manat, Uzza, these are representations of God. When they saw the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, telling them that, wait, who's your great ancestor? Nabi Ibrahim? They would say, yes. He said, Nabi Ibrahim is my ancestor as well. Nabi Ibrahim, what did he do to the idols? Did he worship the idols or did he break the idols? Nabi Ibrahim, alayhi salam, broke the idols that were there in his time. Therefore, the Holy Prophet would come and try and reason with them that when you say you believe in Allah, and I say, I believe in Allah. The belief in Allah cannot be manifested in a statue or a wooden shape. Why? Because if Allah can be defined, then Allah is limited. And if Allah is limited, then Allah should not be worshipped. Yes. If I can define Allah into the shape of a statue, then I am the human being am able to define God. That means God has limitations. That means I shouldn't be worshipping God. Therefore, on the first level, when they kicked them out of Mecca, why did they kick them out? Because their belief in God was different from theirs. Number two, because they believed in a day of accountability where God would question us. Have you noticed many chapters of the Quran are about the day of judgment? If you look at many chapters of the Quran, they're about the day of judgment. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Arabs believed in. Ibrahim, they believed in. But when it came to the day of judgment, a day of resurrection, they hated the verses on resurrection. They said, don't bring up these verses. Qiyama, haqa, waqia. Stop bringing these chapters to us. Bring us chapters that speak about God, that speak about prophethood, but don't talk about the day of resurrection. What would the prophet do? The prophet would turn around and say, no, on the contrary, there's going to be a day, Abu Lahab, Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, Bilal, and the likes of Abu Dhar and Zaid, all of them will be raised equal from their grave. The multi-millionaire and the poor will be raised equal. Those who saw themselves as kings and those who saw themselves as paupers will be raised equal. Our conception of Tawheed is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise all of us on the day of judgment and make us accountable for our sins. Because there's many of us publicly we're religious, but privately, God knows what we do. And that always keeps us in check. Believe you me, if it wasn't the belief in the day of judgment, I would sin more than you can imagine. The only thing that stops me in reality at a base level of Iman is what? Is that I know there's a cinema bigger than this projector, which one day is going to show my whole film. What I did publicly, what I did privately, it's going to reveal everything on that day. The Arab detested this from the Muslims. That I don't want you people to stay here while you talk about this. The third thing was that the prophet of the Muslims was an orphan boy. Why is he someone who's an orphan? He claims to be receiving revelation. This for us is no revelation. There's no Gabriel coming to him. So they kicked them out of Mecca. When they kicked them out, did Rasulullah tell them, fight them back? No. We leave, we go to pastures new. 
If the people of Mecca do not respect us, the people of Medina respect us. Let's go and live in Medina. When they went to Medina, did they leave them alone? Abu Sufyan wouldn't leave you alone. Abu Sufyan would send people to go and harass the Muslims in Medina, to stay on the outskirts of Medina, to try and see what's happening with these Muslims. Are they living happily? Or are they living peacefully? Or are they living under oppression? He wouldn't leave them alone. Not just that. Now he said, I will raise an army and destroy the Muslims. Uh, first years in Mecca, when someone tells me my prophet spread the religion by the sword, for 13 years in Mecca, he never touched the sword. Yes. His companions were killed? Nothing. He was called crazy? Nothing. He was called a sorcerer? Nothing. His own wife died because of poverty? Nothing. His uncle died in front of him? Nothing. We will remain peaceful as much as we can. Until when they went to Medina, when Abu Sufyan now said that we're going to raise an army, these companions were wondering, what is going to happen now? Allah revealed the verse. Udina, permission has been given now to the believers. Udina lilladhina yuqataluna bi annahum dhulimu. Permission has been given to the believers to defend themselves. Because they have been oppressed. What's the condition? That when someone is being oppressed, that someone is moved to a new land. Imagine I was living in Toronto. People were oppressing me. I decided to go and live in Ottawa, for example. I go and live in Ottawa and I find the same guys who are bullying me in Toronto are coming to bully me in Ottawa. I'm like, Habibi, leave me alone for the love of God. Let me go and live there. Let me relax. Let me have myself build a family. No, we'll keep on harassing you. The Quran said, no, peace is primary. But when you're being harassed and you're not being allowed to practice your faith, then there is no harm in you defending yourselves. Allah will ensure that they are victorious because you know when the Holy Prophet came to his companions, he said to them, Abu Sufyan is coming with an army to attack us. Permission for the first time has been given to us to defend ourselves. Before that, there was no defensive jihad in Islam. It took 15 years of the prophethood, of the prophet, before Allah allowed him to raise an army. When he told the companions, the companions turned around, he said to them, are you ready? One of them, I said, I don't need to mention names. One of them turned around, he said, we're not going to achieve victory. Do you know who the soldiers are of the opposition? They have the likes of Abu Jahl. Who else do they have in their army? Utbah bin Rabi'ah. You know who Utbah bin Rabi'ah was? Utbah bin Rabi'ah is the grandfather of Muawiyah. Great grandfather of Yazid. From the mom's side. Hind, her father, was Utbah bin Rabi'ah. They have Utbah bin Rabi'ah. They have Abu Jahl. They have Abu Lahab. They have Walid ibn al-Mughira. Who do we have on our side? Within a few days, he realized who they had on their side. Because when he said that, naturally, there was a fear within them. Are we going to be able to be victorious? Well, how many Muslims were there? In my estimation, in Mecca, the Prophet did not convert more than 150 people to Islam. If we have a majlis today where we have a couple of thousand people, this is a barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet, with his unbelievable humility, piety, knowledge, 150 people in Mecca came towards Islam. When he reached Medina, the Ansar, the people of Medina, helped the Muhajirun. How many was their number? When the Prophet said, are you ready to help me? A group of them said, yes, we're ready. Led by Al-Miqdad ibn Al-Aswad. Yes. The Holy Prophet used to say, Allah ordered me to love four. He ordered me to love Salman, Abu Dhar, Miqdad, and Ammar. If ever you want to name your children, sometimes people email me, what name shall we give our children? And then some go on Google, cool name, or modern name, or something like this. Just go on Google and you type modern name, and you look at the names that people come up with. Some, there are beautiful names in Islam of great personalities. That when your children grow up, they're able to look at that name and say, Dad, thank you for naming me that name. 
As in, I'm honored that my parents named me after Ammar bin Yasir. Honor for me. It's an honor that I could say that I am named after one of the most beloved companions of Ahlul Bayt. When you name someone, your boy, Salman, someone say, but my English friends can't pronounce. It's like the whole world now revolves around the English pronunciation. Imagine them pronouncing Naqshawani, for example. As at least with some of you, you've got an easy name and person can pronounce. Imagine with us. Okay. Now, Salman, Ammar, Miqdad. Miqdad said to the Holy Prophet, we will not do to you what the children of Israel done to Moses. We'll be with you the whole way, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah looked at his companions. He said, this is a defensive jihad for us. We will not initiate. And that's why in the ethics of war in Islam, as well as the ethics of war in other religions, we say, do not be the first to shoot the arrow. Correct? Show that they are the ones who want oppression, not us. Yesterday I made clear, Imam al Hussein made it clear, the primacy of peace is above the primacy of war in Islam. Never build your mentality that war should be the norm in human development. Never. That is the mentality of survival of the fittest in the jungle. Islam wanted to build refined personalities, dignified personalities, but personalities who also were not passive or pacifists. With all my due respect to people like Gandhi and Luther King, with all my due respect for the stands that they had in their life, Islam says we respect those stands, but there's no harm if a person stands to the defend their life. They came towards the battle. Those people, when they came towards the battle, they came with arrogance. If all of you tonight go home, I want you to recite Surah 8, verse 47 till 48. Look at the arrogance of the approach to war. Aquinas says, a just war, there has to be conditions. One of them is what's your intention for going to war? Is your intention justice or is your intention arrogance and showing off? There are some countries in the world today, their intention when they go to war, they tell the people, we have come to bring peace for this nation. Yes? When you tell them, لا تفسد في الأرض, do not bring facade on the earth. They say, إنا نحن المصلحون, we are the peacemakers. When we go to any country, we go with the intent of bringing peace to that country. By the end, as Desmond Tutu used to say wonderfully, he said, they came with the Bible and we had the land. At the end, we had the Bible and they had the land. This happens. That a person comes, he said, Bible, Christ, Bible, Christ. Before you know it, India. And Africa is in their hands. And the people, what do they have in their hands? They have the Bible. The poor Bible sits in front of them. Then you've got others. What's their intention when they go to war? Their intention is, I've come here to save the innocent. And the oil is being swallowed. Yes, oil pipelines are being swallowed. The Quran says the Arabs, when they came to that war, Quran says, never be like them. وَلَا تَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُ مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَارًا This word is fundamental. Which word? بَطَارًا Why do I say this word? Because Imam al Hussein, when he went out to war, what did he say? إِنِّي لَمْ أَخْرُجُ أَشَرًا وَلَا بَطَارًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا Imam al Hussein said, I don't come out to fight to show off. The Quran said the Arabs, when they came to the battle of Badr, the Quraysh, the Quran said, never be like them when you go to war. Don't take war lightly. You know, give me an AK. Let me go and shoot someone. Habibi, relax. What do you mean, give me an AK? And so what are you, an animal or a human being? If an animal is a predator killing each other, I can understand. Ahlul Bayt, السلام, the last thing they wanted was to pick up swords and fight. The only reason they did is because there's an army in front of them of arrogance. And arrogance against the arrogant is worship of Allah. Yes. You can't just be humble with Abu Sufyan, with Abu Lahab, with Abu Jahl, with Walid. You have to be able to stand your ground. You found that the Quran said, وَلَا تَكُونُ كَلُهُ كَالَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بَطَرًا وَرَاءَ النَّاسِ يَصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Don't ever be like those who left their houses arrogantly. Because you know what they did? When they left Mecca, the leaders of Quraysh, they said, bring this animal. Let's have the biggest barbecue in history. Muhammad and his men tomorrow are going to see a side of us they can never imagine. Bring the animals. We'll have a barbecue. Bring the girls. We'll have them dancing for us. All night we'll merry make. 
Aquinas says when a person goes towards war, there must be within their central motive the concept of what? The concept of making sure that they bring peace, that they negotiate peace, that they go to bring some sort of reconciliation between the people. The Arabs came haughtily. We're going to have the biggest barbecue. Rasulullah came with his companions. He said to them, stay over here. He said, do not worry. Allah will help us. Someone said, hold on. We're 313. They're 950. They have horse riders and camel riders. What do we have? Don't worry. Allah, when he wants to, will send unseen forces to help you. True? Because there's some people today who say, when our 12th Imam returns, if he's got 313 soldiers, how is he going to win? Do not worry. While he has Malaika as his mates, he's going to be okay. On that day, Rasulullah said, don't worry. Allah told him there'll be unseen forces to help you. Even without angels. When you have the son of Abu Talib at the front, you don't need the help of an angel. Yes. Because at the beginning of that battle, Utbah bin Rabi'ah, Hind's father, came forward. Came forward full of arrogance. Where are the equals to us? Hamza, the son of Abdul Muttalib, uncle of the Prophet, turned around. He said, listen, we have these personalities. He put them forward. He said, don't bring these. Bring our equals. Hamza came forward again. He said, I, Hamza, son of Abdul Muttalib. To my left, Ali, son of Abu Talib. To my right, Abu Ubaidah. Are we your equals? He said, yes, we're your equals. That day, Ali ibn Abi Talib annihilated the opposition. Yes. An absolute annihilation. If ever you wanted to see a man with the swordsman's skills, where he broke arrogance, it was Ali on that day. That years later, people would remember Umar bin Abdul Aziz says they used to curse Ali, as I mentioned last night in the majlis. used to curse Ali every Friday. And as children, we were raised to curse Ali. He said, one day, my teacher had reprimanded me on a certain issue. I was a young boy. I cursed Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was a way of cursing. He said, my teacher frowned at me. I looked at him. He said, I'm the son of a king. I'm an Umayyad king. You're frowning at me? He said to him, young man, did we discuss the battle of Badr in the Quran? He said, yes, we did. He said to him, what do you think of a person who on that day laid his life in the defense of the religion of Islam? Not in the defense of himself, in the defense of the religion of Islam. He said to him, must be a great man. What do you say about the man who killed more than anyone else on that day defending the religion? He said, must be a great man. He said, the, bo the man that you curse is the man who saved this religion on that day. Yes. On that day, the Imam stood defending the religion. And even in defense of the religion, he and the other companions maintained their dignity on that day. When they maintained their dignity, they sought to defend only Islam. Everyone, please listen to me on this point. The Quran said, They were kicked out of their houses only because they believed in Allah. Then the Quran said, If it wasn't for us telling them to enter defensive jihad, there wouldn't be a single church, monastery, synagogue, or mosque on the face of Medina. Question, if Islam only cares about mosques. Why does the Quran care about churches? There's only one way to Allah, the mosque. So why does the Quran care about churches? Why synagogues? Why monasteries? A synagogue is where the Jewish community go to worship. Do we agree? A church, the, Muslim, the Christian community goes to worship. You have, for example, the monastery. The monks live within the monastery. And you have the mosques. The Quran said defensive jihad isn't just to protect Islam. It's to protect anyone who believes in la ilaha illallah. Yes. Anyone. Because for you to be arrogant enough to say that just because someone's not Muslim, there is no chance of them going to Jannah is far from the teachings of the Quran. The Quran makes it clear. Those who hear the message of Islam and blatantly reject it are different from those who haven't heard the message of Islam. 
Imagine there is someone living in Costa Rica or someone living, for example, in Panama or someone living in Brazil. You're telling me these people, many of them have heard about Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam? No. Many of them live in Costa Rica, Panama, Brazil. Many may not have heard of Imam Al-Hussein. Is it fair that on the day of judgment, God is it part of his justice? He puts someone in hell when they haven't heard the message of Imam Al-Hussein. When they never heard the message of Rasulullah, all they heard was the message of God. Will that be enough? Why shouldn't it be enough? Imam Al-Khumayni, may Allah bless his soul. He makes it clear in a wonderful discussion where he says there's a difference in salvation between the one who has heard about God's religion and the one who hasn't. The one who's heard, even the one who's heard and doesn't believe, they don't believe out of arrogance or because of sincerity, they don't understand what the real teachings are. And further than that, what if they came across the Islam of ISIS, not the Islam of Ahlul Bayt? Would you join the Islam of ISIS? Wallah, I'll run the other side away from Islam. Yes? I wouldn't join that Islam. On the day of judgment, God may say to me, that why did you not become a Muslim? No, God will say the only Islam that came to you was that Islam. The main thing, you were a good human being. You tried to follow what your family had instilled in you in terms of morals. You try to follow that path. It's different from the one who knows about religion and doesn't follow it. The Quran therefore said what? And this is a vital verse because in all honesty, Muslims are different from Islam. Muslims are different from Islam. Muslims, the moment they hear Jewish, automatically there's a tension and a rivalry. Muslims, the moment they hear Christian, automatically there's a tension and a rivalry. The Quran, when it hears Christian, Jewish, synagogue, church, it ordered those believers, protect these houses of Allah on the earth. Because that Jewish synagogue, when I live in Canada, for example, someone says to me that I don't want to make relations with this community because of what may happen politically in another country in the world. What have these people got to do with that? These people over here are your neighbors. Their house is a house of worship of God. Why do you bring other things into this issue? Then someone says, I don't want to be with the Christians. I don't want to be with the Buddhists, with the Hindus, with the Sikhs. Ultimately, all of us are one human race. All of us are seeking to find the path of God. Even the atheist, the atheist is not always atheist. It's sometimes agnostic, not just atheist. You know, when you see someone says, I don't believe in God. There is one type who says, I reject God altogether. There's another who says, listen, I'm... I believe there's something there, but I'm still skeptical. Even that person, if they sincere in their skepticism, there is a place of salvation for them. Because that person is a real human. They're reflecting, they're thinking, unlike many humans who are just sheep on the earth. Believe you me. There are many Muslims, many Muslims, dead men walking, no reflection on their life, nothing at all. Not even reflecting why they believe in Islam. And then there are those out there with skepticism. Sincere skepticism, not arrogant skepticism. There are some arrogantly, they were hurt by a religious person when they were younger. Now they want to take out their frustration on religion. No, we don't want to talk about those. And I'm sorry if someone religious hurt you when you were younger and now you don't want to believe in God. That's not, it's not between me and you. That's between you and the Lord ultimately. But the Quran made it clear that when you enter a defensive jihad, don't just protect your mosque. Anyone who's coming from those Quraysh to attack the Christian's house of worship, known as a church, you stand in front of that church and defend it. And if someone comes to attack a monastery where there are monks worshiping God, go and defend that monastery. And if someone comes to attack a synagogue and you see someone attack a synagogue, you stand in front of that synagogue. There is a difference to be made between political ideologies and religious ideologies. Yes? Some political ideologies I may differ with. Some religious ideologies, no. Religion, all of us are seeking to find the mercy of the Lord. Therefore, the Quran made it clear that defensive jihad is allowed in Islam. That if you are being oppressed simply because you believe in Allah, don't remain silent. Stand up. And that's why Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi The Imam says that those who are entering jihad, there are four key concepts. Number one, that they seek to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. That's the two concepts. The third is that they are truthful 
And the fourth is that they are fighting someone who truly is an open facet, an open sinner. Not just anybody. The question arises, do we have our own defensive jihads at the moment? Meaning, are we in defensive wars at the moment? Someone might turn around and say, what do you mean defensive war? I'm living in Canada. All those watching on the internet, I'm living in the UK, I'm living in America, I'm not in defensive war. A defensive war doesn't only mean the battlefield. Sometimes a defensive jihad can be a metaphor similar to the battlefield. What do I mean? The Quran said they were fought because they believed in Allah. That was their only crime. There are some of us who are now have a defensive jihad in the protection of the belief of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe you me. Now when you're writing an essay at a Western university, if you write God, some people penalize you. Some people mock you. Some people will say, Mother Nature is okay, but don't write God. That for us, do we stay silent or do we defend our faith? We must defend our faith. We must become up to date with the atheist versus monotheist arguments. If I see famous atheists on television, either the likes of Hitchens who's now died, or Sam Harris, or Richard Dawkins, am I able to reply back to the attack on religion that they give? Because that's my defensive jihad. All of us have a Karbala. All of us have a Badr in our lives. It doesn't have to be literally in Karbala or literally in Badr. Maybe your defensive jihad is when an atheist throws questions at me about God. If an atheist says to me, for example, I don't believe in God. Why? Because I see all this evil ISIS and so on. Therefore, I don't want to believe in God. Yes, the existence of ISIS doesn't disprove God. It just shows we have nutcases in the religion. That's it. As in if the ISIS exists, ISIS doesn't disprove God because you're saying to me, I don't believe in God because I see what religion has done. Yeah, hold on, but these people emerging doesn't show me that God doesn't exist. All it shows me is there's some crazy fanatics in religion and non-religion. Someone says to me, yes, but God is evil because he allows so-and-so to happen. Okay, define for me evil because in your atheist world, what's the barometer for morality? Yes, everyone can make up a barometer. I do not believe in God. I want science to be at the top. Habibi, I love science as well. What's wrong with science? I need an understanding of the physical and the metaphysical. There's nothing wrong with science. Science without religion is lame. And religion without science is blind. But science doesn't offer me moral values. That laboratory is not going to tell me about dignity and perseverance. It doesn't tell me about forbearance and patience. The science lab will tell me scientific growth in the life of the human being, biologically, chemistry, physics, and so on, it doesn't offer me the moral barometers I need in this world. Therefore, I could be involved in a defensive jihad as well, but not in Karbala, literally. Where? When I'm defending my values from those who are fighting my values. Likewise, I could be in a defensive war on those who attack Ahlul Bayt or attack me because I follow Ahlul Bayt, salam. Today in the world, there are people, because of them following Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they're attacked. They have to defend themselves. Someone says, shall I just remain silent? Don't remain silent. Write articles about Ahlul Bayt. Write articles about the heritage, the morals, the spirituality, the ethics of Ahlul Bayt. السلام. In that sense, you become someone who is on a defensive jihad against the arrogance of the world. If there are certain arrogant people out there who kill us, because we are Shia. Do we remain silent? No. We, that is our defensive jihad. We stand up. We talk about Ahlul Bayt. We talk about the honor that we have in following Ahlul Bayt, We don't find any disgrace in following Al Muhammad and the teachings of Al Muhammad. Allahumma salam. Let's have a second louder salawat, please. A third in honor of Imam Sahib al Asri was Zaman. Question Who exactly can call for a defensive jihad? If someone pops up randomly, like Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, and then disappears randomly as well. Someone pops up randomly, like Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, and says, Jihad, defensive jihad. Who is it that can call for a defensive jihad? Is it anybody? Who can say to the Muslims, okay, defensive war, all of you go out of your houses and make sure that you fight. No, it's not just anybody. Yes. In the presence of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, naturally it would be them who would call. 
Yeah? The Imam of Ahlul Bayt. If he notices there's a group of people who are attacking, say at the Battle of Jamal, there's a group of people who have come to fight. Can anyone just say, let's go and defend ourselves? On one level, you can in the sense if someone just attacks your house, you can defend. But when there's a whole movement coming to attack the state, there has to be a leader of that ship. That leader would be an imam of Ahlul Bayt salam. Someone says, okay, in the absence of the imam, who would be the one who would initiate a defense? Yes. Would there have to be someone? You find that, for example, in the absence of the imam, those who are the most learned in the area of knowledge, whether it could be jurisprudence only or other sciences, they become a symbol for us. Yes, Our maraja, for example. May Allah lengthen their lives. These maraja are a symbol for us in our lives. When I look at someone like Ayatollah Sistani, believe you me, if it wasn't for his wisdom, Iraq would have gone now towards ISIS. Yeah? Ayatollah Sistani looked at the situation. First thing he made clear, this defense is not just for Shia. It is to protect the Christians. It is to protect the Sunni. It is to protect even the one who doesn't believe in God. It is to protect the people of Iraq. Correct? The people of Iraq are respective because this is how a society should be. A society where there is a plethora of opinion, plurality and diversity in thought. There is a Christian in the church in Mosul. Ayatollah Sistani says you protect that church. You, <coughs> if you're truly a follower of Ahlul Bayt, you go and protect that church. And that's why when he ordered defense must be done of the shrines of Ahlul Bayt by every person in the land. If I'm a muqallid or Ayatollah Sistani, someone will turn around and say, I'm in Canada. Does it apply to me? No. People wrote to him and said to him that if the shrines are being attacked, we believe that what? That permission has been given for you to fight because of oppression. I live in Canada or I live in America or I live in another country. Do I have permission to fight? He would reply by saying no. That your responsibility here, you have your own defense. You protect Allah's teachings here. You protect the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. You maintain good relations, good akhlaq. That's your jihad. In your families, you keep the structure. That's your jihad. However, can he call it in Iraq? Of course he can. For those who follow me, he would say, it is your responsibility to come out and defend the nation. And did they defend the nation? They defended in the most valiant way. Do not forget the martyrs who sacrificed their lives to protect the shrines of Ahl al-Bayt. Believe you me. And when did we have martyrs? From the 1970s and 80s, we lost great lovers of Ahl al-Bayt. And these lovers were those who defended Ahl al-Bayt and defended the sanctity of Ahl al-Bayt. Today, I hear people saying, even Iraqi Shia. Iraqi Shia. You'll hear them saying, Saddam's days were better than today. Calm down. I know there's a frustration. I know there's a frustration. <clears throat> but don't forget that holocaust of 79 till 03. And I purposely call it a holocaust. The Jewish community taught us a major lesson. Never forget the holocaust. And we should never forget the Holocaust of 79 till 03. Don't come and tell me things are better. Things were better at that time. Why? Because today you see some economic issues, corruption in the government. Well, you can take me to any country. I'll show you corruption in their governments. But I'd rather in some cases, corruption lesser of two evils than someone who throws chemical weapons on children. Or than someone who takes... A scholar of scholars like Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, may Allah bless his soul. <coughs> a foundation in the school of Ahlul Bayt takes him and his sister. The sister gets raped. And he, the great scholar, who people until today have to study some of his texts to reach ijtihad, he is taken and killed. And many other ulama of Najaf who were taken and killed. And the Gulf War of 91, many were taken and killed. Don't forget what happened to 7903. Why? Because 79 to 03 people lost their lives defending the school of Ahl al-Bayt in the land of Iraq. And since 2003, you find some people saying, oh, I wish we returned back to the days of 
Saddam, you say that, who did you lose in your family? Yes, it's not nice having a suddenly a family member disappear from you. It's not nice not seeing your uncle or your mom or others again. It's difficult for a person to suddenly lose their family members. And when you ask some of these people, what inspires you to go out and defend in this defensive jihad? What inspires you? Who inspires you? They reply, Hussein and the companions of Hussein. Isn't that true? When you ask many of them, what makes you go out to Tikrit, to Fallujah, to Ramadi, to Mosul, to parts of Baghdad? What made you go out there? Aren't you not in fear? Isn't it a difficult time for you? They're like, we remember the martyrs of the 10th of Muharram. For they are our leaders. They are our guides. They taught us that stand up against injustice. Don't remain silent and be ready to defend at all costs in order to preserve society. Imam, what did he say? He said, I have not come out. I have not come out to show off. I have not come out arrogantly, like the Battle of Badr, how they came out from Quraysh. I have not come out exultingly. I've come to bring Islah. Islah is opposite to Ifsad. Ifsad, there's corruption. I've come to bring Islam back to its roots, a reformation back to the world, the world of peace and dignity and justice. Yes. And then what? I want to enjoy the good and forbid the evil and live by the message of my father and my grandfather. You ask many of these youths, what makes you come out? They're like, one of them says, Habib ibn Mawahir makes me come out. You ask another one, what makes you come out? He says, Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi made me come out and defend. You ask another one, what makes you defend? He says, Muslim bin Awsajo is the one who helps me come out and defend. But there are a number of names who always, you find that they are the ones who people are most influenced by. One side, Imam al Hussein, no doubt. On the other side, Abbas and the brothers of Abbas. Yes. No doubt you'll find there are many. They will say, Abel Fadl al Abbas and his three brothers are an inspiration for us. But then you ask them, that what helped your mom remain patient, they said, Umm al Bani. Because Imam al Hussein, when he came out to Karbala to defend himself, the Quran said, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرَهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍّ They were kicked out of their houses. Imam al Hussein was someone who was chased out of his house. He was not allowed to live in his house. Where was he living? Where was the Imam living? Medina. Do we agree? Imam was living in Medina. What happened there? Imam was living in Medina. The governor of Medina, Yazid, Yazid at the time, ordered that make sure that Hussein is beheaded and his family is killed. Same thing that happened to his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, <laughs> Same thing happened to Imam al-Hussein. He was forced to leave Medina. When he was forced to leave Medina, he had to bid farewell to some of the members of that family. It's difficult when you have to be forced out of your house. But what's more difficult is when you bid farewell to your beloved family members. Yes, you're going to defend. But it's hard because you don't know if this is the last time for you. Correct? There are those who have left Iraq, they never saw their brothers again. There are those who left Iraq, never saw their sisters again. There are those who left Afghanistan, did not see their father or mother again. As you leave, you're forced out because of zulm. You don't know if you're ever going to see your family members again or not. You found that the Imam, at that moment, as he was leaving, his young daughter, Fatima al-Sughra, comes up. And the narrations mention she was unwell at the time. And she said to him, Daddy, are you bidding me farewell? He said to her, hopefully there'll be a day you'll see me again. She said, let me look at the baby one more time. That's her baby brother, of course. She wants to see him one final time. She knows that her dad is being forced out of the land. They bid farewell. But for Abbas and his brothers, they had to bid farewell towards their mom, Umm al-Baneen. 
all of you, whenever you face a difficult moment in your life, there's a moment of test or a moment of trial. All of you try your hardest to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in honor of Umm Al-Baneen. In that moment you recite that Surah Al-Fatiha, see the help from Allah at that moment for you. <clears throat> Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew it wasn't easy for a mom to send her sons to defend Hussein alayhi salam. But for her, who was her real son? Was it Abbas and his brothers? For her, she said, my boy is Aba Abdullah. My master is Aba Abdullah. Everything I have, I'll give away to Aba Abdullah. And she looked at Abbas one final time, knowing that Abbas and Hussein were made to leave their homes, made to leave Medina. And she said to him, Aba al Fad, look after Aba Abdullah. Give everything that you have for him. Yes. And she held his arms when she was about to bid him farewell. She came to the other boys. She had a son by the name of Ja'far, another by Abdullah, another by the name of Uthman. She hugged each and every one of them. And she looked towards Abu Abdullah, bidding him farewell. She hoped one day the eyes of Imam al Hussein would see her again. But deep down as well, she hoped one day the eyes of Abel Fadl would see her again. Yes. If only she saw what that arrow did to the right eye of Abel Fadl. Yes. Harmal bin Kahil on the 10th of Muharram shot four arrows. The first one he shot on the right eye of Abel Fadl. Now naturally that mother is in Medina. These have gone to Karbala. How difficult is it for a mother not knowing what's happening to her boys? It's a difficult moment. And also how difficult is it for a mother wondering, are my boys alive? Are my boys dead? Have they protected Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? The narrations mention she would wait in Medina. Is there any news from Karbala? There's no news. Is there any news from Karbala? There's no news. There was a group who went towards Karbala. Is there any news? There's no news until Bishr bin Hadlam had come towards Karbala, towards Medina. He had made an announcement. I have a new piece of news for you, the people of Yathrib. When he said that I have a piece of news for you, the people of Yathrib, they turned around to him at that moment. Moment. They said to him, what's the piece of news that you have? And amongst them was Umm al -Baneen. She came to him. She said, tell me what's the news. Please inform me. At that moment, he replied, who is this lady? They said to him, you don't know who she is? He said, no, I beg you, tell me. At that moment, they turned around to him. And they said to him, that is Umm al -Baneen. At that moment, he looked towards her and he said, may Allah reward you over the death of your son Abdullah she said tell me about Abba Abdullah he said to her may Allah reward you over the death of your son Jafar she said tell me about Abba Abdullah may Allah reward you over the death of your son Uthman she said to him don't tell me about Uthman tell me about Abba Abdullah then finally the line that broke her she said to he said to her, may Allah reward you over the death of your son Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. The moment she heard Abbas, she dropped the child in front of her. But then she got up again and she asked, tell me about Abu Abdullah. I beg you tell me. When he said to her about Abu Abdullah, she broke down at that moment. The narrations mentioned that she could not contain it anymore. But she had waited in Medina and waited and waited. When is everybody going to be returning? Then she heard the news. Zainab was in the house. She's returned from Sham. And with her is Fidda. She began the walk towards the house of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. Sayyidah Zainab at that moment when she was in the house, she said to Sayyidah Fidda, she said to her, don't welcome anyone into the house. Anyone who knocks at the door, please I beg you, don't let them in. Then all of a sudden 
garden there was a door and it was knocked. It wasn't the first time that Fibba saw a door knocked in front of her. When Fibba heard the knock, Sayyidah Zainab said, please tell them I'm busy. Fibba went, she opened the door, she saw Mulbaneen in front of the door. Fibba turned around, she said, Sayyidah, she said to her, yes. She said to her, do you know who's at the door? She said, tell me. She said to her, it's Umm al -Baneen. At that moment, Sayyidah Zainab walked towards Umm al -Baneen, and Umm al -Baneen walked back towards Zainab. What did Zainab call out? Wa Abbas. And what did Umm al -Baneen call out? She called out what was from the depths of her heart, Wa Hussein and Wa Hussein. إِنَّا لِلَّهُ وَإِنَّا عَلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Raise your hands, brothers and sisters, in this moment. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Allow us to be amongst those who receive the intercession of Umm al -Baneen. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst those who protect the message and the principles of the religion of Islam. For the originators of this majlis, Ya Allah, bless them and allow them to receive the intercession of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We have some people who have requested the verse which allows them to be healed with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The verse for those who are sick. Let us all in one voice come together raising our hands in honor of those who have their difficulties, who have their trials. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma yujibu al-muftarra idha da'a huwa yakshifu al-su'um. 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 Ya Allah, in the name of the one who was ill at Karbala, Imam Zain al Abidin, cure all of our loved ones. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a surah al Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.